Wow, you know, I think Stephanie's led us to such a good place to begin this message. The song is more than a song, it's a prayer. So can we just make that our prayer right now as we get started? Father, we come to you just so aware that you're already here and you're already at work. And we ask that you would speak to us through your word and through your spirit. In Jesus' name, amen. So when I was a kid in elementary school, uh, all the schools in Richland County, I lived in Mansfield, all the schools in Richland County went to this place called the Richland Rural Life Center. So this was a part of our ongoing education. Uh, we were taught about soil erosion and conservation. We were taught about wildlife. We were taught about all the various ecosystems within Richland County. So one day we were at the center and of course, you're seeing, you know, they, they teach all the kids and stuff. And I think this next slide shows the pond. So this is the pond we were at. And, and so this is a bunch of, like, second graders, okay? And we're all given these really long, long uh, nets with long poles. And we were told to stand up along the edge of the pond and to take that net and plunge it into the water, about two feet into the water, down into the mud, and then pull it back and bring all that mud up onto the shore. That's what we were told to do. Of course, once we pulled all that mud on the shore, not only was it this dark, rich mud, but guess what else was in it? Pollywogs. And, and, and when the girls saw the pollywogs, they screamed because they didn't know what they were. They were just squirming all over the place. And if you don't know what a pollywog is, a pollywog is a baby frog that looks nothing like a baby frog. It, it's, it's just a shapeless mass with a tail. Now, over time, what happens is that tail is absorbed in the body. They develop legs, and, and eventually they start to resemble an adult frog, but they don't look like that when they're born. Now, have you ever thought about the difference between a, a, a polywog and a human baby? Of course, there are vast differences, but, but here's the thing I want to point out, is when a baby is born, when a human baby is born, they have everything they need. They have all their necessary parts. They just need to grow. A polywog's not born that way. They're born without everything they need, and over time, they will develop what they need. So I was thinking about this this past week, and I was thinking, you know, in the spiritual life, we're not born spiritual polywogs. You're not missing anything. God has given you everything you need, and there's many scriptures that echo this thought. Look at this. You are complete in Christ. You have been given, even if you're a brand new Christian, you've been given all the things that a mature Christian possesses. You just need to grow. Listen to that same sentiment uh, underscored in these other verses. His divine power, God's divine power, has given us everything we need for life and godliness. Or how about this? Ephesians 1, 5 to 8. Because of the sacrifice of the Messiah, his blood poured out on the altar of the cross, we are a free people, free of the penalties and punishments chalked up by all our misdeeds, and not just barely free either, abundantly free. He thought of everything, provided for everything we could possibly need. So you're not deficient. You're not lacking anything. God has given you everything you need to flourish in this relationship with him. So you have more than enough. This, this life change, this life change that we want to talk about today, this big potential that I think all of us possesses, we have that. We have it and we have it in abundance, but it doesn't happen overnight. So I want to talk to you about spiritual transformation and begin with the question, what is spiritual transformation? One of the great verses of the Bible that speaks to this is Romans chapter 12, verse 2. Look at the verse. Don't copy the behavior or customs of this world, but let God transform you into a new person by changing the way you think. So it's interesting. In the original Greek language, the word transform in this verse is the word metamorpho. That's the word from which we get metamorphosis, okay? So going back to your days in middle school and high school, remember biology class? Metamorphosis is that process of change that a caterpillar will go through that turns them into a butterfly. Now, it's interesting, when God uses the language to describe what he wants to do in you and in me, he uses the language of transformation, of total radical change, that you and I are to be metamorphosized by God. That's what the scriptures teach us. So, I've got to get back to where I was. I've totally lost myself in my notes. <laughs> there we are. Okay. So I have a definition. This is, the, this is a definition that all the pastors came up with. This is the definition of spiritual transformation. Spiritual transformation is God lovingly changing our thoughts, feelings, and actions to resemble Jesus in community for the good of the world. 
That's what spiritual transformation is all about. So this is our calling. This is our sacred path. It's what we as pastors are here to help facilitate. So what I want to do is in this first part of the message, I want to elaborate on that definition so that you can better understand what is God's part in spiritual transformation and what is our part. So we're going to look at the definition, break it apart. The first thing I want to tell you is this is a fundamental shift affecting the total person. Now, if you've been in church very long at all, you've probably heard the statement that human beings are made in the image of God, right? We've all been made in the image of God. But what does that mean? What does that mean exactly? What does it mean to be made in the image of God? Well, I think at a very baseline understanding, you need to understand that we are persons like God. And what makes us persons is we have a mind, a heart, and a will. We're thinking, feeling, acting beings. These are the ways we reflect God because none of the rest of creation has that unique stamp upon its life like human beings do. We are thinking, feeling, acting beings. Now, sinful people, our thoughts, our feelings, and our actions have all been tainted and marred by sin. But still, it's those three dimensions of personality that reflect our creator. So what God is working to transform is your mind, your heart, and your will. He wants me and you to get to the point where the way we think and how we feel and the actions we choose in this life better reflect what he intended in the original design. Now, you can tell a whole lot about a church by determining whether or not they address all three of these things. Because, you see, there's a lot of unhealthy spirituality out there that kind of fragments human personality and will only address one. So healthy spirituality will always address the mind, the heart, and the will, your thoughts, your feelings, your actions. Unhealthy won't. So let me just show you these because maybe you've been in churches or been had experiences like this in the past. There are some churches that just believe in feeding the mind. So the mind is important. I mean, it really is. We, our minds need to be changed. They need to be metamorphosized. The Bible encourages us to know the words, to discern truth from error, to be good students of the Bible, to rightly discern the word of truth. That's what the Bible says. But it is possible to know the Bible inside and out and still not be spiritually transformed. In fact, the Bible addresses this in Romans chapter 2. Don't assume that you can lean back in the arms of your religion and take it easy. I have a special word of caution for you who are sure that you have it all together yourselves and because you know God's revealed word inside and out. While you're guiding others, who's going to guide you? So you can read the Bible and you can learn a lot about God. But that's not the same as knowing God. You need redemption beneath your eyebrows. It's not just your head. It's not just your thinking that needs to be changed. So this is the thing I've been trying to emphasize and teach for years. Every spiritual activity that you and I engage in is first and foremost about our connection with God. It's about knowing him better, loving him more deeply, relating to him as a person because we're both persons. So we relate to one another in this personal way. It goes way beyond trying to master a book. There's another group that are also known about feeling the experience. So experience is a really important part of our spiritual life. God wants you to do more than just know him. He wants you to know him personally. He wants a relationship, a relationship where you feel his presence, touched by his love, that you're moved by worship. He wants that experience for you. Experience is a good thing. It's even a necessary thing. But did you know that sometimes in some churches, churches become worshipers of experience instead of worshipers of God? They begin to worship their good feelings instead of worshiping the God they were created to worship. Sometimes even a church will elevate their experience above truth. And just as long as they've had this experience, it really doesn't matter what the Bible says. And Paul warns us against that as well. He said, they take up with every new religious fad that calls itself truth. They get exploited every time and never really learn. So feelings and experience are really important in our spiritual life. But feelings alone will never lead us into a whole and healthy relationship with God. The third imbalance is what I call find your way. So there are churches that put a great emphasis on what you do. This is what a Christian looks like. These are the boundary markers, if you will. What we do does matter. How we live matters. The Bible makes it clear that God is not just changing our mind and our heart, but changing our actions so that they come into conformity with what he wants us to do, the things that please him. But you can do some pretty impressive moral things. You can do some pretty impressive spiritual things and still not be connected to God. Listen to Jesus, because Jesus warns us about this. He says, many will, say unto me, many will say to me that day, Lord, Lord. By the way, anytime you're reading the Bible and you see someone's name repeated, you see it twice like that, the Hebrews, this is an idiomatic expression, it's a way of saying, 
I am really intimate, I'm connected. So this is a person who's saying, I'm really connected to you, Lord. Lord, Lord, did we not prophesy in your name? And in your name drive out demons? And in your name perform many miracles? Then I will tell them plainly, I never knew you. Away from me, you evildoers. So again, this is a person who's saying, I'm really connected to Jesus. I'm very intimate with him. They're doing some really impressive things. But friends, it's not what we do that makes us believers. It's what was done for us. It's that we have faith in what Christ accomplished on the cross. So the first sign of an unhealthy faith is a faith that fragments human personality, that only addresses the mind, the heart, and the will. By the way, psychology makes the same mistake, doesn't it? Because psychology is divided into three large camps. There's cognitive, which is all about the mind. There's emotive therapy, which is all about the feelings, the experience. And then there's behaviorism, which is all about what we do. Again, a fragmented answer is not going to heal people because we're more than just a mind. We're more than just a heart. We're more than just our choices. We're all three of those things, and all three of them need to be redeemed. Now, it's interesting because this really matters to me, and I want to make sure it's grounded deeply in the Word of God. So there's a a scholar, his name is H. Wheeler Robinson, and he's an outstanding biblical scholar. He studied the Greek and the Hebrew of Scripture, and he's done this study of the word heart in the Bible. So you and I as English speakers, when we see the word heart, we associate that with what? The mind, the heart, or the will? The heart, right? This is what I feel with. I I love you with all my heart. We We think of that as a seat of the emotions. So if you're reading your English Bible and you see the word heart, you think, well, this is talking about my feelings. And I just want you to know nothing could be further from the truth. Because Hebrews didn't fragment human personality the way we did. So if you look at the word heart, we have this chart here for you. In the Old Testament, most times it's just referring to personality, the mind, heart, and the will. Or in the New Testament, same thing. The abundance of heart is about that. Sometimes it's referring to the emotional state, 166 times in the Old Testament, 19 times in the New. But notice, the word heart even more frequently is referring to the mind and sometimes even to our choices. What I'm saying to you is in both Testaments, Jewish people, whether they were the apostles or Jesus or the Old Testament prophets, none of them fragmented human personality the way we do. None of them elevated the mind above the heart and the will. None of them elevated feelings above the mind and the will. None of them uh, elevated our choices above our mind and our heart. They all looked at the, the totality of our person because the totality of our person needs to be restored. So that's the bottom line when it comes to transformation. God wants to change all of you. The second aspect of spiritual transformation is conformity to Christ is the central objective. You and I were called to emulate Christ, to look to him as our pattern, our model, and our example. Now, imitation is a part of human nature, isn't it? In a sense, you and I were born to imitate. Psychology tells us that we often imitate others even when we're building our own personality. And it's most pronounced in adolescence. You have a middle schooler or a high schooler. How many times has your middle schooler and a high schooler come home with an attitude and you realize they picked it up from their friends? They, they just saw that. And they thought, well, they're getting away with it. Maybe I can get away with it too. Or they begin to dress like them and act like them and watch the same things, all the while insisting that they're just being their own person, right? But they're trying on other people's ideas and thoughts. This is something we've all done. It's something we we see in others. We see that that thing that they're doing gets them acceptance. And maybe if I do that same thing, I'll get acceptance too. And what it does is it sets sets us up in life to chase after what's popular, what everyone else seems to be doing. Now, sometimes it's really obvious, especially if you're not involved in that trend. Like I saw this meme the other day and I laughed. It said, this is the last thing a craft beer sees before it dies. And and so this is, you know, I mean, (laughs) it's just a real common Millennial look these days, right? I mean, the long beard, the shaved high and tight, long hair on the type, t- tattoos. And, and, and I get it. And it's comical. And we've all done it. So millennials, don't take offense. Everybody's done this in their life. You don't want to see me in bell bottoms, okay? But it, it was true of me too. Uh, the desire to copy and find acceptance doesn't end at 18. It doesn't. We, we're, we're always copying We're always trying to find acceptance. You know, uh, business people, we do it more successfully now, maybe a little more hidden. Successful business people copy other successful business people. Many times pastors will copy and emulate the, the, the preaching style of another successful pastor. The cowboys are always trying to copy another successful football team <laughs> in their strategies and, and, and all that. <laughs> But the point is this. Every single person has this hunger for a greater image. And the question is, why do we do this? Why, where does this desire to imitate come from? Why is it that we can't be satisfied with ourselves? There's no question we're chasing after something. It's like we're looking for something that we've lost. 
And I'll tell you, that's the key to understanding it. Because we did lose something. We're all looking for something we lost because at one time we had an identity, we had a definition, a true self-image of being created in the image of God. And sin marred that. Sin marred that. It tampered with it. Sin caused us to look away, to, to divert our eyes from our true pattern, to look at other fallible and broken people like ourselves and begin to emulate them. If you look to Christ, that's what you were meant to be. Notice Paul writing about this in Romans 8. God knew what he was doing from the very beginning. He decided from the outset to shape the lives of those who love him along the same lines as the life of his son. The son stands first in the line of humanity he restored. We see the original intended shape of our lives there in him. After God made that decision of what his children should be like, he followed it up by calling people by name. After he called them by name, he set them on a solid basis with himself. And then after getting them established, he stayed with them to the end, gloriously completing what he had begun. So Jesus Christ is the image of restored humanity. When you look at Jesus, you understand what you were meant to be. When you see him, his pattern, his attitudes, his love, his lifestyle, that's the lifestyle we're supposed to be emulating. So spiritual transformation is about changing the mind, heart, and will to look more like Jesus Christ. How is God going to do that? Well, I want to tell you there's three catalysts for change. So Jesus gives us the pattern. Once again, we're looking at him in terms of the pattern in Luke chapter 6, verses 12 through 19. One of those days, Jesus went out to a mountainside to pray and spent the night praying to God. When morning came, he called his disciples to him and chose 12 of them, whom he designated apostles, Simon, who he called Peter, his brother Andrew, James, John, Philip, Bartholomew, Matthew, Thomas, James, son of Alphaeus, Simon, who was called the Zealot, Judas, son of James, and Judas Iscariot, who became a traitor. He went down with them and stood on a level place. A large crowd of his disciples was there and a great number of people from all over Judea, from Jerusalem, from the coast of Tyre and Sidon, who had come to hear him to be healed of their diseases. These troubled by, those troubled by evil spirits were cured, and the people all tried to touch him because power was coming from him and healing them all. Now you could call this Christ's sacred rhythm. It's the way he lived. Jesus first in this passage, you might have noticed he spent time with God. Second thing he does is he gathers a community around himself. The third thing he does is ministry. So this is the order. Here we go. From solitude, time alone with God, to community, the vital relationships to sustain us in life, to ministry, serving others for the sake of God. So that's, that's the pattern that Jesus lived. Now, you have to live it in that order, by the way. You can't reverse it and get the same results. And this is what a lot of us do. We go out, we try to do ministry, we try to do service for God, without any help at all. And we fail. And when we fail, we run to our friends, our, to our community, say, hey, can you help me with this? And when all else fails, last resort, we pray. This is why life doesn't work for us. We've reversed the pattern that Christ showed us. Now, people have used all sorts of terms to describe these three spheres, these three catalysts, and I'm going to show them to you this morning. Some people call it communion, which is relationship with God, community, relationship with one another, and co-working, working with God in service to others. Other people have called it our, de our desert, our group, and our project. Some people have referred to it by the commands that Jesus has given us, that we're called to love God, that we're called to love one another, and we're called to love our neighbors. At Spring Creek, we just simplify it and call it grow, connect, serve. But all of them are saying exactly the same thing. We see the pattern in Jesus. We see what God wants to do in our life. We see how he wants to do that. And so what we want to do is we want to grow, connect, serve, because that's the way we become fully robust in our spirituality. So let's look briefly at each one. The first one is growing. So this is all about loving God. Jesus told us, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your strength, and all your mind. It's interesting. Anytime the Bible describes our need for God, it seems to always revert to the language of craving. Listen to David. As the deer pants for streams of water, so my soul pants for you, O God. Or how about this in Psalm 63? O oh God, you are my God. Earnestly I seek you. My soul thirsts for you. My body longs for you in a dry and weary land where there is no water. So you and I were made to crave for God. We need him. We need more of him. And we want him to have more of us. So how does that happen? How do I grow? How do I get more of God? And how does he get more of me? Well, that happens through the spiritual disciplines. I love the way Henry Nouwen, it's always been my favorite definition of spiritual disciplines. In the spiritual life, the word discipline means the effort to create some space in which God can act. 
Discipline means to prevent everything in your life from being filled up. Now, it wasn't that long ago we did a series here on the spiritual disciplines. We called it Rooted. That's still available in the bookstore. We did a longer series some years back called Pathways. And both of those series are to show you the spiritual disciplines. The spiritual disciplines do just that. They create this space in our life for God to have access to me and for me to have access to God. And God does incredible things when we engage in the disciplines. I love the way Richard Foster breaks them down. He says there's inward, outward, and corporate disciplines. So there's certain ones that are inward, like meditation, fasting, study, and prayer. We spend time with God alone doing, engaging these things. There's others that are more outward in terms of our performance and simplicity, solitude, submission, and service. Those are all forms of spiritual disciplines. And there's disciplines that we engage in as a body of Christ. Confession. We don't do a lot of corporate confession, but we have done some in the past. Uh, Worship, guidance, celebration. You all were engaged in a form of spiritual discipline this morning when you were worshiping, when you were singing along with Stephanie as she was leading us. We were opening our lives and saying, God, we want more of you. God, have more of us. That's a discipline that we do to get more of God. So get this. All of these things are about how we push back life to create space for God. We, we, we create this hour on Sunday morning. Say, God, you have me and my undivided attention. That's a spiritual discipline. The danger to the spiritual disciplines is this, to pursue them as an end in themselves. You see, the disciplines are an all, always a means to an end. They're always to get more of God and for him to have more of me. But I can pursue a discipline and begin just to fall in love with the discipline. Like some people study the Bible and just get so mesmerized with studying the Bible that it becomes a relationship with a book. Some people, when it comes to worship, they're not really worshiping God. They're worshiping how good they feel in that moment. And this is when the, 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 the discipline actually begins to work against the life it was intended to create. So this past year, I was in Canada. I did some teaching from coast to coast, and I was in Bruxy Cavey's church, and I love the way he said this. He said, the story of the Bible is the story of God wanting us to come to him directly, offering us the tools, which are the disciplines, to help, to help our relationship, and then watching brokenhearted as we fall in love with the tools rather than God. So the tools are there. God gives those to us to give us more of God and for him to have more of us. Use them to pursue him, and you'll grow. Pursue them at his end of themselves, and you won't. The second catalyst for growth, so we grow, we love God. The second catalyst is we connect, we love one another. Here's how Jesus said it. A new command I give you, love one another. As I have loved you, so must you love one another. By this will everyone know that you're my disciples if you love one another. We can't live lives of isolation. We need touch, we need attention, we need conversation, warmth, and affection. We need each other. We really sincerely do. I love this promise Jesus made. He said, for, for where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. Let me ask you a question. Is Jesus with you when you're alone? Yes, of course, right? But he just said, where two or three are gathered, there am I in the midst. So what does that mean? What that means is that when you and I come together as believers, when it's two or more of us, we come together, there is a special sense of Jesus' presence that we don't get when we are alone. It's just the way it is. I love the way Dallas Willard explained this. Again, one of my favorite quotes. Personalities united. So when we come together, personalities united can contain more of God and sustain the force of his greater presence much better than scattered individuals. The fire of God kindles higher as the brands are heaped together and each is warmed by the other's flames. So yes, each and every one of us have a private and personal relationship with Jesus Christ. But you know what? We're a family. And there is no Christian that's an only child. The question is not, am I going to be a part of a spiritual community? The question for a believer is, how am I going to live in this community of faith? We're going to talk more about that next week, so I'm going to leave it for now. Talk to you about this last area, this last catalyst for growth in our life, which is service. We love our neighbors ourselves, And that's what Jesus said in Luke 10, 27. Love your neighbors yourself. So this is what we talked about last week in Contagious Joy. If you weren't here, check out the message online. Go by the bookstore and get a CD or DVD copy of that. We were talking about how God has set us up in this world to go out and do good, to be difference makers, to actually go take the initiative in doing the things we want done for ourselves and to do them for other people. And so 
when we grow, when we connect, when we serve, when we do all three, they are absolutely catalytic in producing the life God intended for us to have. We need them all. So when God wants to grow you, what does he do? He puts you in the three most loving environments he knows. A relationship with him, a relationship with God's family, and a relationship of giving love to a world that's desperately needing love. So let's talk about in our time remaining, a centered versus a boundary-oriented spirituality. Now, some of you might have noticed I had a, 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 a pineapple here up on my pulpit, and you're thinking, Josh had a pineapple a few months back, <laughs> and he was talking about sex. Where are we going, Pastor? <laughs> and I want you to know this is more than a sex symbol, so I want to talk to you about pineapples. Uh, I, I spent a summer when I was in college in Panama, Central America. They grow pineapples in abundance there. Uh, a lot of the meat of the pineapple in uh, Panama is white, not yellow, and it, it really tasty pineapples. But I learned a lot about pineapples while I was there, and one thing I learned is pineapples contain no starch reserve, which means once they're picked, that's as ripe as it's going to get. So if you get a pineapple and you don't think it's fully ripe when you got it at the store, leaving it out for a week, it ain't getting any riper, Okay. <laughs> It's as ripe as it's ever going to be. So it's really important to know, how do you pick a ripe pineapple? Now, there's all kinds of what they say old wives' tales about how to know a, a, a really fresh pineapple. It used to be people say, if you can pull these leaves easily from the centermost part of the stem, then that's a ripe pineapple. That's not true. Uh, there are other people say it's thumping. You know, it's a good solid sound that that's, a, that's a, a ripe pineapple. That's not true either. Other people say, no, you can tell by the color. But I want to tell you, even though this pineapple is green, doesn't mean it's not ripe. Because some pineapples are green and fully ripe, and some are yellow and not ripe at all. You know how you tell? Smell. It's smell. You got to smell it. And if it's pineapple and sweet, you got a good one. Now, I want to tell you, this is not a ripe pineapple. I was up at, I was at, at Tom Thumb, and if you want a non-sniff pineapple, don't go up to this Tom Thumb, because I sniff... <laughs> every single one of them, trying to find a ripe pineapple, and none of them were ripe. And, and the reason, the reason I, I wanted to share that with you is because some people think that the way to tell a healthy, vibrant Christian is by what you see on the outside. And I want to tell you, it's not what you see on the outside. It's that fragrance that's arising from the inside that tells you whether or not a person has a vibrant walk with Jesus. So in Jesus' day, Jewish leaders spent an inordinate, an inordinate amount of time focused on three aspects of the law, circumcision, Sabbath keeping, and dietary regulations. You see this throughout the New Testament. And you want to know what's really odd? There's not a single Jewish rabbi in the first century that would say that any of those things are at the heart of the law. In fact, what they would say, the heart of the law is this verse. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your might. So if those three things are not the heart of the law, why do they get so much airtime in the gospel? Why does circumcision, Sabbath keeping, and eating habits, why do those things seem to rise to the top? And I'll tell you why. They're boundary markers. Now, boundary markers are highly visible, relatively superficial outward behaviors that mark a group, that tells you who's in the group and who's out of the group. That's why you call it a boundary markers. So the Pharisees began to define spirituality by these three relatively superficial, highly outward kind of uh, behaviors in someone's life. They said these things define who's spiritual and who's not. The problem is spiritual life doesn't work that way, does it? You can't change a person from the outside in. You change a person from the inside out. I grew up in a Baptist church, don't hold that against me, but we had a similar problem. We had this little phrase, we'd say, good Christians don't smoke, drink, cuss, or chew, or run around with women who do. And, and, and what was really sad is that we define the spiritual life, not just by those things, but all kinds of outward behaviors you could observe. And the problem with that kind of thinking is it's a boundary-oriented approach to the spiritual life. And you focus on that, you lose your, you lose your life. So every encounter Jesus has with the Pharisees comes down to this issue. Let's take a look, closer look. The boundaries versus the center. This is Mark 7, 5. So the Pharisees and teachers of the law asked Jesus, why don't your disciples live according to the tradition of the elders instead of eating their food with unclean hands? Now please know this is not about hygiene. This is not about sanitary situation. This is the Pharisees asking why they don't go through these elaborate purification rituals before they eat. 
Because in the Pharisees' minds, it's that practice that showed the people who were in. And the people who didn't do that, well, they were obviously out. So what Jesus is going to do is school them on what's the real issue in defilement. And he says this. For from within, out of men's hearts, come evil thoughts, sexual immorality, theft, murder, adultery, greed, malice, deceit, lewdness, envy, slander, arrogance, and folly. All these evil things come from inside and make a man unclean. So Jesus says, listen, guys, what you need is cardiology, not dermatology. Because the problem, the problem is not on the surface of your life. The problem is deep within. It's your heart. You see, we do need redemption. We need redemption at the core of our lives. And friends, it's no different today. There are all kinds of people who claim Christ's followership, who are good at attending church and reading the Bible and showing up at every event. But you know what? If we're not becoming more loving, if what lies at the core of our life is unchanging, then something's seriously wrong. Now, you see, once this pattern becomes ingrained, it becomes a way to reinforce superiority and exclude others. This is why churches become like private clubs or country clubs and, and even a gated community. We turn the life of God into a weapon for the religious have-nots, against the religious have-nots, and for the people of God. So there's a problem with this do-gooder approach to Christianity. And Dallas Willard, once again, he talks about it. He said, if you try to become Christ-like in your external behavior... You'll simply turn into a devoted legalist and people will run from you. This is why people were so angry at Jesus, wasn't it? It was all the people he hung out with. It was the prostitutes, the tax collectors. Because you see, in the Pharisees' minds, you know, these, these boundary markers, they violated them all. There's no way these people could be spiritual. But Jesus didn't look at spirituality from the outside in. He looked at it from the inside out. And once that person surrendered to the life of God, once that person allowed God to come in and change this core of who they were, Jesus declared them to be inside. Because that's the way God has always worked. My life might not look at your, like your life on the outside, and it doesn't have to. Because God's work starts within. He begins by healing the core of who we are. And it may take a while before that manifests on the outside of my life. But it's not my behavior that makes me a child of God. It's allowing God to do his work inside me that makes it a child of God. That's what faith is all about. So how do we know our core is being changed? Well, once again, Dallas Willard, these are brilliant questions. He said, I asked myself two questions. First, am I growing more or less easily irritated these days? Don't you hate that question? <laughs> and then I asked myself, am I growing more or less easily discouraged these days? These are the questions you can't dodge. Because they're not about the outward condition, they're about the inner condition. And, and, and you know, if my, if my life is not changing in that way, then we really have to question whether or not God is transforming the core of our life. They're really super questions. In fact, listen to Paul make these same distinctions, 1 Corinthians 13. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but I have not love, I'm only a resounding gong or clanging cymbal. If I have the gift of prophecy, can fathom all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have faith, it can move mountains, but I have not love, I'm nothing. If I, possess, if I give all I possess to the poor and surrender my body to the flames but have not love, I gain nothing. Now, those are all really impressive religious activities, aren't they? Speaking in tongues, prophetic powers, understanding all mysteries, having all knowledge, mountain-moving faith, giving away everything I possess, sacrificing my own life. Yet, yet Paul says they're, they're devoid of any value to God if they're not done out of love. We're just a, a noisy gong. We're a clanging cymbal without it. So love is the great authenticator. Love is the great authenticator that I've been with God. So when God wants to change your life and mine, he begins by putting us in the three most loving environments he knows. A relationship with him, a relationship in the family of God, and a relationship of giving love to our neighbors. It's love that's going to change our life. It's being immersed in the love of God. This is why I've always loved, and I've shared this with you many times, I love the fact that Jewish people conjugate their verbs in the complete opposite way of the rest of the developed world. A Jewish person doesn't do first, second, third person. It's not I, you, he. They conjugate their verbs he, you, I. You know why? Because Jewish people believe that life begins in the third person. Because he is, you are, I am. Because he is. Because he loves, you love, and I love. Life begins in God. Life begins in the third person. You and I, the way we become great lovers is by experiencing great love. This is why the Bible says we love because he first loved us, right? 
He loved us first. He takes the initiative in love because that's what we need the most. I love this example of the fruit of the Spirit. How do you know if somebody's manifesting the fullness of the Spirit of God in their life? Well, here it is. But the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. A lot of people look at that list and say that all the other qualities that come after the word love, that love is a cluster of fruit, and all of the others are just expressions of love. And I think that's true. So the question is, when was the last time a non-believer was blown away by your capacity to love the unlovable? When was the last time somebody stopped and took notice of you and said, there's just something really different about you, the way you treat people, the way you care for people? When was the last time an unbelieving world was blown away by our kindness instead of our cruelty, our goodness instead of our self-righteousness? See, God is looking on the inside. And I started thinking about all these leaders I've known over the years. And I've known a lot of really impressive leaders, smart leaders, I mean, scary smart people that I think I could sit at their feet and I could learn so much that I don't, I mean, it'd be like a whole seminary education for me just listening to this individual. There's some pastors that are just such gifted communicators. I just think, wow, if I, if I could just begin to emulate their style, I would be so much more effective. There's some people I've known, that leaders that are just charismatic. They just have this awe about their personality. You're just drawn into them. They're excited they're, and all that. But the key, the thing you're supposed to be looking for, you and I, is love, right? And I ask myself, who have I known that I'm just blown away by their capacity to love? And, you know, I've known a leader and I'm, I've known this person for 25 years, and, and I have consistently known nothing but love from this person. You know, sometimes I have it up to here with people, don't you? I mean, just sometimes. I'm not all the time. Not today. I'm not that way with any of you today. <laughs> but, but sometimes you just have it up to here. And I've gone to this person, and, I just, and I'm venting, you know, I'm letting them know. And they come with this bigger perspective, all this reality I'm not seeing and it's balanced, and it's healthy, and it's good, and I think, oh, you know, there's so much yet to be done in me. I, I need to be more like this person, and it's my spiritual director, Carolyn Atkins. And for, for every week, for 25 years, I have sat at this woman's feet and, and shared my life. I tell people all the time, in seminary, I learned all about Jesus, but I learned to walk with him from Carolyn Atkins, and, and, and she just, she's been this embodiment of that for me. And, and if you ever see that in me, to any degree, I, I promise you it's been Carolyn's influence because she's helped me to better engage and connect with the life and the love of God. So my challenge for you this week is simply this. God has given you, if you're a believer, you got everything you need to grow. He's given it all to you. You, you lack nothing. You have it all. But what you have to have to be a robust Christian, you, you got to love God. you got to love your the believing family, and you got to love your neighbor as yourself. God's going to have you grow, connect, and serve. Those three things will produce the life of God. Let's pray. Father, thank you so much for this place, for this time we have together. Thank you for your word, your truth, and this reminder of what you're trying to do in each and every one of our lives. God, may we cooperate with that. May we yield our life to what you're doing, and may you, God, with that surgeon's scalpel, cut away the things that don't need to be there, to, uh, to, to uh, mend and to heal the things that are broken that must stay, and that, God, we would come to experience your love so deeply, not only in our relationship with you, but our relationships within the family of God, that we would be so transformed by that experience that we would go out and help other people who've been untouched by that love to know that same love we found. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all.